This is the Chic Assignment check-in for March 2022. Hi everyone, Jennifer L. Scott here and welcome back to The Daily Connoisseur. We are here at the Chic Assignment check-in for March. I hope you have been enjoying this month's assignment. We're going to dive into Vivaldi, T.S. Eliot, and much more in today's video. The Chic Assignments are brought to us by the Chic Society, which is channel memberships here on YouTube. We have so much fun. We do one podcast every Friday and we either have a Zoom call or we go live once a month. We also have a pen pal program, so I dive into really deep topics in the Sheik Society and we have a lot of fun together. So if you're interested, I will leave the link down below or you can click the join button. Right now you're seeing some of the upper tiers and these are the Sheik connoisseurs and I'm going to be mentioning the elegant connoisseurs at the end of the video. They have businesses or they're writers or artists or high patrons of the channel. So I wanna thank the Sheik Society for bringing us the Sheik assignment. Okay, let's dive right in. We are learning about Vivaldi this month and we listened to Spring from the Four Seasons performed by the Capital String Quartet and what a beautiful performance that was. And I know that's not the most traditional performance of this piece. I just loved their rendition of it. So I will also leave a few others down below if you'd like to explore this more. What I love so much about these assignments is that by learning about these famous works of art, we can then identify them when we're out in everyday life. And a lot of you said, I've always heard this piece, I just didn't know who it was by or what it was. And now we know it's Vivaldi, Spring from the Four Seasons. Unfortunately, Vivaldi died in poverty and obscurity, much like Van Gogh did, who we studied last month. But thankfully, his work has been resurrected and now he is fully appreciated for the genius that he is. So let's learn a few interesting facts about Vivaldi right now. I pulled these facts from Connolly Music and I will leave them linked down below. It's a wonderful website and I highly recommend you check them out. Antonio Lucio Vivaldi was born on March 4th, 1678, the same day a large earthquake occurred in Venice. Young Antonio was taught to play the violin by his father, a professional violinist who was also a barber. Father and son toured Venice playing violin together. At age 15, he began studies to become a priest and he was nicknamed El Pret Rosso, or the Red Priest. It is speculated that this was due to his red hair, which was a family trait. Vivaldi suffered from asthma, which limited his duties administering mass, but gave him more time to spend writing music. So sometimes something like a setback like that actually works to our advantage, right? He produced many of his major works while employed for approximately 30 years as a master violinist at the Osperdale della Pieta, a home for abandoned children. The boys were taught a trade, the female orphans received expert musical instruction and became members of the choir and orchestra. Their performances were well respected all around the region. His famous set of four violin concertos, The Four Seasons, which is what we studied, 1723, is considered to be an outstanding example of program music. Each concerto depicts a scene appropriate for each season and is accompanied by a written description. Johann Sebastian Bach was a huge fan of Vivaldi's music. He transcribed several of Vivaldi's concerti for keyboard, strings, organ, and harpsichord. The musical compositions of Vivaldi total 500 concertos, 90 sonatas, 46 operas, and a large body of sacred choral works and chamber music. So he was so prolific. Look how much he created. So he was supported by Emperor Charles VI of Vienna, and he was even given the title of knight by him who commissioned his pieces. Vivaldi relocated to Vienna at the invitation of Charles VI, who died shortly after, leaving Vivaldi with no one to support him. So that was a turning point in his life. However, because his music had not kept up with the times, he was forced to sell off his compositions in order to live. Unfortunately, Vivaldi died a pauper and was given a simple burial. The master musician was not even afforded music at his own funeral. Only the pealing of bells at St. Stephen's Cathedral noted his passing. So listen to this, this is crazy. So his complete catalog of music was not fully realized until 1926. A large collection of manuscripts were discovered in a boarding school in the Piedmont, diligently researched and procured by Dr. Alberto Gentili, a music historian at the University of Turin. So then World War II happened, which stopped the momentum of Vivaldi's Renaissance. But in 1951, London hosted a great post-war festival of Britain, presenting a concert season devoted to mostly the Baroque master and firmly secured his place in music history. And listen to this, 2006 was the most recent discovery of a lost piece 
Vivaldi's opera Agrippo, which had been last been performed in 17. 30. So it is very unfortunate that he died a pauper and did not know how influential he would be. I hate that. I really do. It, it bothers me so much. It's like with Van Gogh. I just wish they knew how amazing they were. You know, like Vivaldi was a genius and he was so prolific. Look at all the works that he um, completed. So what can we learn from this? Because I always try to apply this and, and think about my own life and how we can and help each other with this. Uh, is that even though times were hard and things seemed to be bad for Vivaldi on many occasions, he kept producing art. And even though he was never alive to see it, millions and millions and millions of people have benefited from his work long after he passed away. And that is a legacy, truly. So even if it seems like the world is rejecting us, keep producing keep working, keep creating. Okay, next we are studying the poetry of T.S. Eliot this month, and we're going to learn just a little bit about him. We're not gonna go into his biography too much because we're going to examine two poems, one full poem and then a portion of The Wasteland, which is his most famous poem. So I have a confession to make. Now, I love poetry. I love it, okay? I'm not one of those people who doesn't like poetry, but I have never been that drawn to T.S. Eliot, but he is one of the most famous poets. And The Wasteland is considered one of the most famous works of modern times. So I don't know if there's something wrong with me or it's just not clicking, but you know, I love Emily Dickinson, Robert Frost. I love Dorothy Parker and Wordsworth and most of the other poets that we've studied, I'm really into it. But for some reason, when I read an Eliot poem, I think I just don't understand them that much. I really have to look at commentary. Also, they don't rhyme and there's like a different meter to them. So anyway, let me know what you think. I think it's still important to study artists that you're not necessarily drawn to or that aren't your favorite because we can still learn things from them and it's always good to expand our horizons. So there's my confession right there. But I do appreciate um, the clever and witty nature of his poetry. So T.S. Eliot was born Thomas Stearns Eliot and he was born September 26, 1888 in St. Louis, Missouri in the US and he died January 4th, 1965 in London, England. So he was an American English poet, playwright, literary critic and editor and a leader of the modernist movement in poetry in such works as The Wasteland, which we're going to read in just a moment, and Four Quartets. Eliot exercised a strong influence on Anglo-American culture from the 1920s until late in the century. His experiments in diction, style and versification revitalized English poetry and in a series of critical essays, he shattered old orthodoxies and erected new ones. And that's, I mean, I get that, I get, I get that. He, <laughs> he really shattered old previous conventions of poetry. So I think I'm just old fashioned. The publication of Four Quartets led to his recognition as the greatest living English poet and man of letters. And in 1948, he was awarded both the Order of Merit and the Nobel Prize for Literature. The first thing I wanna look at here is just a piece from the first stanza of The Wasteland. Now, I find it helpful to look at what the poem is about first with these before I read the poem. Sometimes I do the opposite. Sometimes I'll read the poem and then I'll look up what it is, but in this case, I enjoy it more if I know what it's about. So I'm reading this from Britannica. The Wasteland expresses with great power the disenchantment, disillusionment, and disgust of the period after World War I. So that sets the scene for you here. There's also one line of German that comes toward the end of the stanza that I'm going to read, and I'll tell you what that line means right now, and I'm probably going to completely butcher that reading. <laughs> but it means I'm not Russian at all. I'm from Lithuania, really German. Okay, so keep that in mind for when we get to that part. Let's read a portion of the first stanza from The Wasteland land, the first line is very famous and I had heard of it. So it says, April is the cruelest month, breeding, lilacs out of the dead land, mixing, memory and desire, stirring, dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering, earth in forgetful snow, feeding, a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us coming over the Starn Bergesi. With a shower of rain, we stopped in the colonnade, and went on in sunlight into the Hofgarten and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Bin gar kein Russen stamm aus Litauen. I'm butchering this. <laughs> Ek Deutsch. And when we were children staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, he took me out on a sled and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight. And down we went. In the mountains, there you feel free. 
I read much of the night and go south in winter. So that's just a portion from the first stanza of The Wasteland. It's a rather long poem, so if you'd like to read the full poem, I will leave it linked down below. But that first line, April is the cruelest month, is a very famous line. Okay, the next poem I want to read to you was one that I enjoyed from him, and it's called Conversation Galante. Galante means a gentleman or a ladies' man or a suitor. And I'll tell you what it's about before we read it so that you can get the context. But it is about a conversation between a man and a woman and he's making an idle comment on the moon. So the man is trying to take the conversation to a deeper place. He's comparing it to music. The woman is trying to keep things light and frothy. So it's like they're on two different wavelengths here. So I found this one to be interesting. So this is Conversation Galante, and here we go. I observe our sentimental friend, the moon, or possibly fantastic, I confess. It may be Prester John's balloon or an old battered lantern hung aloft to light poor travelers to their distress. She then, how you digress. And I then, someone frames upon the keys that exquisite nocturne with which we explain the night and moonshine, music which we seize to body forth our own vacuity. She then, does this refer to me? Oh no, it is I who am inane. You, madam, are the eternal humorist, the eternal enemy of the absolute giving our vagrant moods the slightest twist, with your aid indifferent and imperious. At a stroke our mad poetics to confute, and are we then so serious? So I actually did really enjoy this poem. I like that. It's like, have you ever had a conversation with someone where you're both just in different places or on different wavelengths? You're trying to talk about something deep and they're trying to keep it very shallow and light and conversational and maybe there's a bit of frustration there, or maybe you can just appreciate that the conversation is not going to go as you planned. So I do like this poem, and that is my favorite poem by T.S. Eliot. So I would love to know your thoughts on T.S. Eliot's poetry. What is your favorite poem by T.S. Eliot? Let us know in the comments down below. Sheik assignment number three was to prepare your 10 item capsule wardrobe for spring or for autumn for our friends in the Southern Hemisphere. And I've had some videos coming out this month about the 10 item capsule wardrobe and I hope that that has helped you. My main purpose for talking about this is because I believe it's very important for us to get dressed every day and to express our true style. I think how we dress is a very important form of self-expression and a lot of people get stuck in dressing a certain way that isn't truly them or they're in a very casual rut where they wear the same things every day and they're not expressing their sense of style. But when you do the 10 item capsule wardrobe, you are able to express your style and you get more comfortable with dressing up on a daily basis and suddenly you start to have a lot of fun with your wardrobe and things really open for you. You start looking at other areas in your life and where you can infuse style into those as well. So I hope that you have enjoyed those videos. I will leave them in the iCards up above so that you can watch them if you haven't already. And chic assignment number four was to journal our joy this month. So in the previous month we journaled our gratitude so I'm noticing a pattern because I'm journaling both. I'm journaling my gratitude and I'm journaling my joy. And I find that there's a little bit of crossover, but what I'm finding is that gratitude is the big things and joy are the little things. Like for example, my home might be on the gratitude list, super grateful for my home. And then the joy might be the wallpaper in my room, <laughs> okay? Or my nice bedding or little things like that that just bring me joy. Of course, I'm grateful for all the things that bring me joy too, but it's interesting to note just the first things that come off the top of your head and what brings you joy. And I find that writing it down really expands your capacity for the subject. So I have a greater capacity for joy this month. And it's like I'm going out of my way to look for things that bring me joy and notice that which is really good and something that we all need right now, especially because times are so hard and stressful. So I would love to know your experience with journaling your joy. And now we are going to look at the elegant connoisseurs from The Chic Society. The 90 Day Memoir Workshop with Alan Watt from the LA Writers Lab. Amy Floor from Azalea Spa Goods. Bernadette M. Petrata from Polite Society School of Etiquette. Jenny Williams from Carrot Top Paper Shop. Elaine Brisebois, Certified Nutritionist and Women's Weight Loss Coach. Emily McNeil, Fine Art. Ashley Buffa, Freedom Mom Smart Kid Chore System. Guy Blaze, Author of Love Like the French. Indiana Davis from Willow Nook Seasonal Subscription Box. 
Carrie Van Hooser, author of Tis the Season for Poetry, Lindy Sellers, YouTuber, Nicole Brignol, founder of Lovely Bits, Sarah Miller from sarahmillerjewelry.com, Mrs. Shockley from A Home for Elegance, Teresa Maples from Self Care Routine Cards, Sarah Morgan Wellness, Alan Scottish Shortbread, Sturm Brothers Custom Design and Fine Jewelry. And thank you to the following Catherine Ray, Adelaide Beer, Carly Tom from Living in Loveliness, Cindy Bolharowski, Gabrielle Julie, Janelyn Voigt, Janice Leitner, Jet Rally Heron, Gina K. Kenry, Jenny Candelaria, Juliette Keeler Laban, Julie Coleman, Linda Eckloff, Marie Cottle, and Maria Condor. Thank you so much again to the Chic Society for bringing us today's video. I hope that you enjoyed the Chic Assignment for March. Let us know about your experience in the comment section down below. And we can continue to do this for the rest of the month and I'll have a new one for you in April. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Keep calm and remain classy and I will see you in my next video. Goodbye.